Hello and good afternoon everyone. Uh, on behalf of Observer Research Foundation, let me welcome you all to this exciting afternoon when we are here to discuss a recently released book, Kautilya's Arthashastra Philosophy of Strategy by Dr. Medha Bisht. Uh, Dr. Bisht is an assistant professor at the South Asian University in New Delhi. And with this book perhaps has given us one of the most definitive accounts of uh, the relevance of Arthashastra, of its uh, importance in, in the way we think about strategy, grand strategy, and of course, international relations theory as well. Uh, so to discuss this book's many virtues and to provide us with an informed critique, we have two very uh, interesting and informed discussions with us. Uh, Colonel P.K. Gautam from Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense and uh, Institute for Defense and Strategic, uh, IDSA, Institute for Defense Studies and Analyses. And I have Dr. Kajari Kamal, um, uh, who is with the Takshila Institution as well as a guest lecturer in the University of Hyderabad. So welcome to you all and uh, welcome uh, and thank you for agreeing to be part of this conversation, which I look forward to very much. Uh, for the viewers who are joining us online, uh, let me just a uh, very brief note that you are uh, free throughout this conversation uh, to place your questions, comments, observations on the Q&A uh, tab that you might see on your screens. Uh, we will take them up uh, uh, in the second half of this conversation. Uh, and it would be very useful uh, to have your sense of about this conversation, about the issues it generates, as well as about some of the central claims being made in the book. Traditionally, the study of international relations uh, in India has ignored uh, India's civilizational heritage. It has ignored uh, the sources of uh, indigenous sources, uh, in some ways, uh, intellectual traditions, uh, in when, when deciphering or trying to decipher India's conduct on the global stage as well as when, in, you know, when we talk about the broader philosophical debates of uh, justice, order, and morality in the international system. Western intellectual traditions have been a dominant frame of reference, and uh, this is something that we have seen uh, over the period, not, in, not simply in the way we discuss some of the issues around strategy and grand strategy, but also in the way we have developed the scholarship around the subject. So if you look around, there are very few books, very, very interestingly, by Indian authors on the subject. And so at the moment, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, from this book and some of the other books that are coming out, we are witnessing a, a renaissance in this in this field, and I think it's uh, it's wonderful to be able to have that. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of it is we, will, we owe that a lot to the three individuals who have joined us today: Colonel Gautam, um, Medha, and, and of course Kajri, who is who will be coming out with her own book very soon. Uh, now, this is a point. It, it is important to emphasize this point because this is a point that has also been made very recently. Uh, by, um, you know, our foreign, uh, foreign minister, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, in his book, uh, In the Indian Way, recently released, in which he points out, in, he, he has written an interesting chapter on, on the relevance of Mahabharata and how to use perhaps that as a lens in interrogating uh, India's uh, conduct on the global stage and how uh, that is something that has been ignored uh, by scholars uh, around the world. So this is, again, a very welcome addition to that, to that literature. Uh, to that, you know, it is um, Dr. Bisht's book uh, is uh, is a very important addition to that wider body of knowledge, especially at a time when India is, uh, you know, coming um, on its own on the global stage, when India is interrogating or India is interpreting the world more confidently than ever before on its own terms. So therefore, India's intellectual traditions, indigenous intellectual traditions, become all the more important. What is also important is, uh, is something that as a scholar uh, I feel very strongly about and that this book doesn't delve into this issue as a binary between Western and non-Western traditions. And I think that's a very important point that this book makes, that if we go into this assessment, if we, go, if we keep on blaming the, the other as, uh, as it were, uh, then I think we end up uh, in a very difficult and a dangerous position. We end up in a situation where uh, the, the knowledge is not, the generation of knowledge suffers. And so uh, I think what uh, Dr. Bisht does in, in her book is, is that she's interrogating a seminal text on Indian ancient uh, statecraft through various lenses, including Western lenses, and in that sense has been able to integrate it with multiple disciplinary epistemologies. And this makes this book even more important for students and scholars and the wider strategic community. So let me invite uh, Medha uh, to uh, make her presentation first before we go to the two discussions. Medha, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Pant. And uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me just thank you, Professor Pant, for having me here. I'm indeed very, very delighted. Also, uh, I'm very delighted actually to share this forum with Colonel Gautam. Uh, 
uh, because Colonel Gautam has been in this journey since 2012. And uh, his enthusiasm, I would say, towards Arthashastra, you know, has been very, very infectious. In fact, whenever, uh, you know, I got distracted, there was some seminar, there was some workshop, uh, there was some symposium uh, to which he kindly um, invited me. And uh, that really helped me dwell on the subject in a much more uh, deeper manner. So Colonel Gautam, uh, thank you for getting the indigenous back in. Uh, and I think uh, you really played a very, very important role in this journey. So uh, what I'm gonna do today is that I am going to uh, perhaps flag off uh, some of the primary arguments. Uh, but I thought uh, before uh, flagging off these primary arguments, it will be nice, it will be better if I highlight some of these nuances which one comes across in Arthashastra. And I feel that uh, these nuances are important. It's important to be familiar with these nuances because these nuances give us a bigger picture. And uh, before we contemporize Arthashastra, I would say to the 21st century, it's very important that uh, we get uh, a good look, a good anchor to this uh, holistic to this larger picture that Arthashastra is really embedded in. Now, the first nuance uh, which I thought, you know, I will uh, talk about today is really the definition of political in Arthashastra. And I would say that uh, this definition of political is important because it not only helps you to understand the rationale behind certain practices or stratagems uh, which are mentioned in Arthashastra, but it also helps us to draw our attention to the understanding of issues, themes, which I would say are interdependent uh, uh, on each other, you know, in a relational manner, but also in a holistic context. Uh, what I mean uh, by the political is that, uh, you know, the analysis uh, of the political here is not just restricted to kings or institutions or practices, but it is really suggestive of the entire ecosystem required for the effective Rajaniti, which I would say was the internal administration of the state, and Kutaniti, which was the strategy. And what we learn from this is that Rajaniti was not divorced from Kutaniti. In fact, Kutaniti was very much anchored to Rajaniti. And in fact, in today's language, if I have to translate it, I would say that good governance and diplomacy, in fact, go hand in hand. So yes, uh, I would say uh, uh, that, uh, you know, when you look at Arthashastra, state really determines the definition of the political. But at the same time, this political in Arthashastra, as it is talked about, you know, is informed by interdependence of elements uh, where protecting and preserving both human and non-human elements, I would say, become very important and they are the responsibility of the state. And in this backdrop, I would say that, you know, you would find policies in Arthashastra, which is actually talking about the protection of animals or even the preservation uh, of, the eco of, 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 of the environment, of the ecology. And in fact, uh, Thomas Trotman's book, on elephants in ancient India has indeed really looked at this issue. The second one, which I thought is again critically important, is really the genre of strategies which are spelled out in Arthashastra. And I would say these really range from tactics such as nonverbal communication, positive and negative manipulation, um, espionage, which was primarily about information gathering, and dialogic traditions, uh, which again are uh, very much there in Arthashastra. For example, if you look at the Upayas, uh, the Tan Dan, Dandabhed, Tan Dan are primary relationship building strategies. Uh, Dandabhed are relation uh, drifting strategies. And I would say that, you know, it's uh, these uh, strategic genres, in fact, make Arthashastra a text which helps us to understand a repertoire of diplomatic practices. And I consider this as a very, very significant contribution uh, from a non-Western uh, diplomatic resource, particularly because the discipline of diplomatic studies is highly impoverished, primarily because it is built up on the experiences of Europe. Also, I would say what becomes important is really the dialogical structure in the text per se. And I would say, you know, there is a bradedness of the micro-narrative and the macro-narrative. What this means is that the story of the state is really braided into multiple building blocks, 
which are associated or, or you know, which have been conveyed as a Saptanga theory, which are the role of the allies, uh, role of the council of ministers or good council, role of treasury, good economy, role of defense, uh, 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 you know, uh, strong defense, uh, role of people and role of force. In fact, the intertwining of these frames gives meaning to order, power, morality, justice, etc. The third aspect, or the third nuance, which I think is very, very important and is very significant for us to understand, is that the text carefully deliberates on the consequences of action. There is a clear relationship between knowledge and practice here. In other words, what makes Kutaniti relevant is the purpose of Rajaniti, which is defined as Yoga Shema, well-being of the security of people, well-being and security of people. The judgment behind political actions become important, and in fact, judgments dictate how one knows and really understood the world. And the reference point of this judgment was the Hindu philosophical tradition, uh, Dharma. In fact, state has been considered as a moral force which facilitated the spiritual and uh, the moral uh, development. And lastly, I would say the last nuance which becomes very important um, is really the ways of thinking. And this only uh, this not this is important because this not only has a consequence for theorizing a text like Arthashastra, but it also highlights the importance of geography of ideas. And I would say that if you miss this very important, significant point, uh, we are actually uh, missing on the intellectual legacy, uh, uh, which uh, in fact can inform the discipline of international relations. And this philosophical tradition, I would say, is very important because it's this philosophical tradition which gives meaning to political concepts like power, order, morality, etc., which I dwell on. So uh, I would say it is really in the backdrop of these nuances that I would present two major arguments in my book. Uh, um, and I have really tried to develop these arguments uh, uh, based on these nuances, which in fact are distributed in the entire book. Now, the first argument which comes across um, and which is very significant for uh, the reading of Arthashastra is, uh, is, is the notion of order. And I have argued that the notion of order, in fact, is central to the understanding of Arthashastra. And this notion of order, in fact, is anchored to the concept of dharma. And the second argument, uh, which I have argued for, is that Cotillian strategy, in fact, is a web-based strategy. It is a network-based understanding where the notion of relatedness informs how governance, rajaniti, and strategy, kutaniti, needs to be perceived or they interact with each other. And I have developed these two arguments, I would say, in three distinct sections or parts of my book. In the first section, I dwell on the epistemic practices, philosophy of knowledge, or ways of thinking which govern the text. In the second section, I look at the intertwining of the meta-narrative and the micro-narrative. And in the third section, I have established a conversation between Arthashastra, international relations theory, and international relations practice. So coming to my first section in which I really look at the epistemic uh, understanding or ways of thinking, um, I think, uh, you know, this is a very important section because it really helped me to understand the larger epistemic question of dharma and how this concept of dharma actually reconciled the philosophical and the strategic thinking. And it is here that the title of the book comes forward, uh, The Philosophy of Strategy. And I would say that this way of thinking or epistemic practice becomes clearer through this particular word which Kautilya uses called Anavikshiki. And he says that Anavikshiki is in fact the methodology of Arthashastra. Anvikshiki, I would say, was therefore a philosophy of, region, uh, of, of logical reasoning which embraced contradictory Hindu philosophical traditions. And therefore, the mention of three Hindu philosophical traditions, Samkhya, Yoga, and Lokayat, all in the same breath, is very fascinating because all of them are contradictory. For instance, Lokayat, uh, 
which uh, primarily is a materialist tradition, is an empirical positivist tradition. Samkhya uh, primarily starts from uh, non-dualism, uh, uh, sorry, st starts from dualism and then goes uh, uh, to uh, non-dualism. What it really nudges us, uh, it, 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 it tells us uh, to understand or discern uh, the phenomena in terms of uh, the material, and I would say the additional elements, and a yoga philosophy, yoga philosophy, which is primarily based on experiential knowledge. Now, to me, you know, when I was trying to really make sense of the philosophical tradition and the way it was really speaking to the political concepts, one idea which really came out is that entities in Arthashastra are not given. They evolve organically. And the character of the entity can be influenced by the dominant tendencies or the dominant characteristics. And it is for this reason that Arthashastra puts an emphasis on the excellencies of each of the seven elements of the Saptanga theory, which can lead to either an inferior state or a superior state. What this also suggests is that what Arthashastra tells us, it tells us to be mindful of both empirical, that is positivist tradition, as well as reflectivist or interpretivist or critical tradition in terms of understanding the phenomena outside. Now, in the second part, I primarily explored the relationship between feasible and uh, desirable elements. And here what I do, I primarily look at the relationship between the micro and the meta-narrative, as I just said, uh, which I would say are braided in classical India thought. Now, this is not a very unique thing to Arthashastra. In fact, this braiding of narratives is equally prevalent in Ramayana, and it is equally prevalent in Mahabharata. Mahabharata, in fact, is a classic primarily because it takes into account all these micro stories. So the micro and the macro is really braided, and that's what I find fascinating about Indian classical thought. In order to elicit this interrelationship between narratives, between the micro and the meta-narrative here, what I did in this section is that I resorted to systems analysis. And I chose systems analysis primarily, I would say, for three specific reasons. First, uh, it helped me uh, to focus on the interaction of units, um, and that's important in systems thinking. Uh, second, systems thinking is also important because it tells you the story through interconnection of concepts, which I would say are broad variables. And finally, systems analysis also enables me to privilege situational or contextual nature of knowledge. And it was here that I was really looking at the Hindu philosophical tradition and systems thinking just provided me that. So uh, systems thinking, I would say, in a way, helped me to emancipate the holism of grand strategic design, which is the macro narrative in Arthashastra, which gave meaning to power, order, morality at the micro level. And thus I have used the term these terms or these concepts, power, order, morality, in a relational manner, which means that they were directed towards achieving yoga shame, which was the security and well-being of the people, as I just said. And this was, I would say, the central principle which guided uh, the dharma of the king as well as informed the dharma of uh, the people. And I would say that one of the major takeaways, you know, from uh, this section is that it directs our thinking to relational ontology, which means examining interactions, relations, values, practices as really the what or the object of study. This also means that one goes beyond studying fixed attributes, which are generally characteristic. Uh, which would generally characterize some of the major IR mainstream theories, for instance, classical realism and neoclassical realism. Uh, uh, not neoclassical realism, but neorealism, structural realism. The third part, uh, I would say, establishes a conversation between concepts and vocabulary. And here I take a cue from some scholars, and I argue that, as Professor uh, Pant also said, one should go beyond the binaries of the West and non-West, as ideas migrate and evolve uh, their own meaning in different uh, cultures. And this, I think, is very important. Much has been written uh, on it, but I found this uh, argument very fascinating. And it is here that you know I really support this argument that there is a need for a conceptual apparatus for terms like power, order, morality, sovereignty, and all these become important. And therefore, I talk about them when I introduce the term strategic ontology 
Now, this demand, and to my mind, this is again very important, it's been written extensively about this demand that we take both the geography of ideas and the history of ideas seriously, especially to my mind when we're talking about the rise of Asia, especially to our mind when we're really trying to understand uh, China's behavior. And I would say the conceptual thicket which, uh, which, which informs concepts like power, uh, like peace, you know, all become very important. And there is where the indigenous needs to be brought out. Uh, I navigate this argument in this particular chapter by examining the concept of order, which is also one of the central sort of tenets uh, concepts in Arthashastra that I anchor to. And I do this at two levels. I do this at a conceptual level and I do it at an analytical level. At the conceptual level, I examine the different meanings of order. I examine its normative meanings, descriptive meanings, strategic meanings, critical meanings, and the cognitive cultural interpretations of order. And what I'm essentially doing here is that I'm problematizing the non-West as just being a norm taker, but also in the process emancipating the agency of understanding the meanings of concepts um, as they move from one geographical space to another. At the analytical level, I in fact take a cue from English school and I look at the operative principles of order which Arthashastra uh, gave meaning to. And uh, uh, the, uh, the specific meaning which Arthashastra gave uh, to these operative principles of order, I can say, are primarily practices, uh, which primarily are the six methods of foreign policy, the Shadagunya theory, the code of conduct where dharma becomes very important, and also the specific environments of action or the mandala. And finally, in my, uh, towards uh, the, the last few pages, uh, which is really a reflection on, uh, uh, you know, on some of these concepts which I came across in Arthashastra, I go back to the tradition of, uh, of dharma. I go back to the concept of dharma. But here I'm not just talking about the tradition of dharma. I am actually talking about the traditions of dharma. Because if you look at uh, dharma, it has very much being used in Buddhist philosophy too. In fact, if you go back to the anti-colonial movement, Gandhi and uh, Tagore have a conversation on the meaning of dharma itself. So mm -hmm. I would say that you know one really needs to really look at the tradition of dharma as it has traveled, uh, you know, across uh, uh, across time uh, in uh, India. And uh, therefore, I would say that one of the major takeaways, at least methodologically, is that, um, you know, Arthashastra, primarily because it emphasizes on this, uh, uh, on this philosophy uh, of reasoning, on Anivikshiki, it in fact supports critical skepticism. The culture of positivism is rejected in Arthashastra. And this is one of the main problems uh, which I think we as a group also had, uh, where Arthashastra was primarily, or Kautilya, was either being compared uh, to Machiavelli or was being, uh, uh, you know, uh, compared as a very crafty statesman. Uh, now, one major uh, takeaway, uh, therefore, I would say is that, uh, you know, Arthashastra, you know, will reject uh, the culture of positivism, and Arthashastra does not really focus on the ontologies of objects, but ontologies of practices and relationships and how things are in fact connected to each other. And I think it's very, very important for any student of diplomatic uh, uh, studies or diplomacy, the relations really become the core focus of study. And it is primarily for this reason, I would say, I also argue that to understand Arthashastra, one needs to understand the network-based strategy. And uh, if you look at uh, uh, you know, the uh, concept of networks in international relations, it's particularly very fascinating. Uh, a lot has been written uh, on it. And I feel that uh, uh, you know, if one was to contemporize Arthashastra at all, uh, one, uh, uh, it would do great benefit if you look at uh, network, the literature around networks in international relations. So this is what I have to say uh, over to you, Professor Pant. Thank you very much, Neha. That was uh, quite a job you did, you know, almost uh, summarizing the book uh, in, in 15 or 20 odd minutes. And I think uh, the arguments you laid out are actually, uh, uh, you, you, laid, you laid them out quite categorically. And, and what is interesting is that uh, there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, ontological and epistemological questions that you raise in the book, uh, which I think are important both for those who emphasize on the primacy of indigenous uh, traditional cultures and, and for, for them to make uh, and to make them the source of, of studying Indian conduct on the global stage, as well as for on the, you know on the West uh, in the West, uh, 
who have actually ignored these traditions for whatever reasons uh, those might be. So unless you bring them together, uh, you won't be able to have the kind of conversation that perhaps you know you are proposing. And therefore, for you to bring in almost you know every single uh, major school of thought in IR, you know whether it's English school or systems theory or traditional um, uh, you know traditional IR uh, theorizing, I think that does great service because you have an entire generation in this country who has been brought up on these theories. Now, if you tell them that, look, these are all redundant, you just have to study Arthashastra and everything will be fine. I don't think they're going to, you know, have, a, have, a, in, have an engagement with, with, the, with the body of knowledge that you are propounding. And similarly, if you tell those who are studying Arthashastra primarily as an ancient text, uh, if, you, if you don't incorporate the wider body of knowledge that is out, available out there, then I think that kind of conversation that perhaps all of us in this, you know, in this discussion want uh, to propagate would not happen. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's that way I think it's, it's, it does great service to the scholarship on the subject. So with that, let me invite Colonel, uh, Colonel Gotham first for his comments on, on, on the book and, and also the wider project uh, of, uh, of using intellectual, uh, India's intellectual traditions, uh, traditional intellectual traditions, uh, to understand uh, IR, to understand uh, politics, and to understand India's conduct on, on the global stage. Colonel Gautam, the floor is all yours. Thank, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Pant, and Akhil Kumar, and Sidan Thira. There's a minor correction. I'm no more in the IDSA. I am an honorary distinguished fellow with the Center for Military History and Conflict Studies, USI of India. Okay. So thank you for inviting me, and thank you, Meda, for uh, writing this book. Now to under understand Medha's book, I was fortunate to be a witness to her path of scholarship for many years. It is educative to see how the seeds were sown, were, were sown and uh, she has written three chapters in the edited volumes, volume two, three and the fourth one, which sort of brings out what she has later dwelt on. So for students, I recommend at times you go back to her that, that stuff also. Now the purpose of the book which she has written is to highlight the relevance of discipline of IR in strategic terms and offer a revisionist case of understanding Kautilya's Arshas. Since the text seems to be understood and interpreted from the narrow frame of real politic, bereft of any ideational and philosophical value. And, and I must say, the author, she has achieved this aim. Medha's book has been reviewed and discussed of late one in written form and twice via webinars, also called Diginards. Like a fire and forget missile, the book takes a new shape and form when it gets reflected and reviewed, no longer in the control of the author. That's why it's fire and forget. Clearly, as a good missile of sorts, it has hit the right note and the right target. After all, it is only scholarship, debate and reflection that ideas mature. And in a short span of few months, the book has set in motion a chain of events to further ideas on scholarship as it consolidated and reinterprets philosophy of strategy using concepts and vocabulary from the ancient classical texts that seems or are very much of contemporary relevance. For example, in a review by Shiv Shankar Menon in the Journal of Indian Ocean Studies, the book engages with the understanding that Arthashastra on its own terms. It is argued that Arthashastra could represent a fundamental intellectual challenge to Eurocentric IR theory, say, mod, say Chinese IR, mostly based on realist principles, which, uh, realist principles like the Chinese IR. But that would require another book by her if she wants to compare with the Chinese IR. And Menon has then urged historians, diplomats, archaeologists, behavioral economists, and many others linking its intellectual history and philosophy with early Indian Mauryan practices. And so he is given a, a, another call uh, for the young people to, you know, improve upon it and research further. Second, Dr. Saurabh Mishra of the Amity University in a symposium in August had discerned two trends in scholarship. The first is actually now over, that who is Cotillia, who is the author, which century. That scholarship has actually, it's, no, it's gone. Now, he has analyzed that this is the new wave of the second wave of scholarship, and which is basically dependent on the idea content, and analyzing the ways and means, and the ends. 
and uh, like and as the professor pant pointed out it compares to modern theoretical theories they like you know kaplan and uh, godrej etc she has used five six theories that which in her introduction i really enjoyed because still it is not theoretically grounded of the work today nobody will say they'll say this you know the, she is preaching some old ancient tradition so that's the good thing third uh, in a book launch of south asia university uh, done on september there were fantastic indian academics of very high caliber so probably they knew you know it's like ghar ki movie dal barabar they knew everything you know they have been brought up with kautilya but what i what what impressed me was professor professor hilary brifa of royal college of defense studies king's college london who had read it for the first time and she summed up to say that the concepts such as raksha palana and yogashema are the key takeaways for her and they push us to be reflective with the need to reexamine and decolonize our curriculum so here is a professor of uh, uh, rcds london uh, reacting to this book now this spontaneously honest remarks clearly indicate that indic traditions are long, no longer nativists but are global and thus reinforce global ir and is thanks to meda now what i can add to this debate the next 5 minutes is according to jj meyer who was the translator from german to uh, from sanskrit to german in 1930 arth shastra is the library of india so this is now being proved empirically the same text can be perceived and theorized from dif different prisms late michael libib of sai saw it as a political realism and a contemporary manual of intelligence studies others have found it as a manual of economics while in warfare and military strategy it surpasses sun tzu and has contemporary ideas of even hybrid war and now for strategic relevance of kautilya arshast at the inter intersection of public political theory and ir we have meda interestingly unlike the patriarchal or male dominated traditions of india the academic charge on making indic traditions relevant to global international studies has been led by some spirited ladies from india and i'm sure kushwan singh would have appreciated and written a book on them like deep shita shahi sajid kumal namita behra jaya shri devakanandan jayati shivastav namrata goswami and so on deep shita shahi in a book on kotilya has joined it seamlessly with the constructivist paradigm and further has contributed to refine indic tradition based on advaitya in ayur now here comes meda who has drawn the sar or the nectar of the philosophical concepts of strategy a work by a political scientist on philosophy is commendable that to indian philosophy surely bezel little heart is not the originator and of grand strategy indian philosophy is just not the six darshan shastra which is for yourself you know self realization it's and meda has done a fine job in expanding what anvikshiki is when engaging with secular discipline such as state craft her book gives a reader what is the thinking behind ways means and ends for for international relevance she has sensibly found its contemporary equivalent in kaplan system theory and its scientific framework which is actually anvikshiki in practice the book is a serious work heavy enjoyable and challenging work of non fiction and i suggest that there is a need to study the text as authored by rp kangle the original and then read commentaries and studies commentary of bhashya is an important way of expanding the aphorisms in the sutra literature in sanskrit and regional languages what meda has done is a fine job of revisiting traditions by using hermeneutic approach hermeneutics actually is interpretation of the bible but it's come into our language so hermeneutics approach and it seems as if it is contemporary the stuff inside the book which is but meda is not satisfied she in her conclusion has argued for a work of competing narrative from buddhism and she says the contrast between upaya upaya means and sakushal upaya skillful means which is also upaya kaushalya kaushalya needs to be done so here she has brought in buddhism of course there is also jainism which other scholars can then take on and sikhism in islam the book has set the pace for a deep reflective way of thinking a political theory and philosophy that is normative that is what ought and not is with dharma enveloping order 
Her scholarship is one of the starting blocks and it is hoped that the study of Kautilya and other similar traditions get a boost and recognition by the attractive power of scholarship. After approving the book proposal for, from the publishers many years ago, happily the book is out and I am privileged to endorse it, which I read out. This is a book what I am waiting for. Veda Bish has revived and made contemporary the political come philosophical text of Kautilya. She navigates and integrates the foundational Indian Indic text and tradition seamlessly with various disciplines. A refreshing piece of work of knowledge production, recommended as a textbook for international studies, social science, strategic studies and international relations. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Gautam. That was uh, a very uh, expansive endorsement of, of Medha's work, which is, I think, uh, um, all the more important because you have been uh, all leading this project uh, at, at a very broad level f for decades now. Uh, so it's, I'm sure Medha would be very happy to get that kind of an endorsement. Uh, but I think the, the larger point that you make is, 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 is very important uh, for, a, for a student of international relations or political science uh, to, have a, to have a book that is grounded in theory. Uh, which is which is grounded in conceptual literature, uh, whereby we are not just using uh, uh, you know cotillia like Sunzu is used often. You know, you make a remark here, you make a remark there, and somehow you think you know cotillia. But unless you ground cotillia in the in the historical context, unless you ground him in the contemporary theoretical context, I don't think a conversation about cotillia which which transcends time and space is possible. And I think which is which is perhaps what the what a lot of those who want to build Indic traditions want to do. So I think it's a, that you know, the, that point is perhaps needs to be underscored. Uh, you have done it, and, and I hope that uh, whoever reads Medha's book will come uh, will, will you know will reinforce uh, that trend going forward. So with that, let me invite uh, Dr. Kajri Kamal for her comments and uh, observations on the book, and and also okay. the larger project that we are interrogating today. Kajri, floor is on. Okay, thank you, Professor Pant. Uh, I'm hoping I'm audible. Um, and uh, good evening, everyone. It's always a pleasure to see uh, Colonel Gautam and Medha on screens like this. Um, at the outset, I think I'd like to just first congratulate uh, Dr. Medha Bish, the author, for I think uh, what is an outstanding contribution to Cotillian studies. Uh, from a very small Cotillia desk uh, in the IDSA library a few years back to a rich academic discipline, I think we've really come a long way. Um, and we've witnessed a true revival, Professor Pant was calling it Renaissance, uh, a revival of the text, especially in terms of appreciating the academic value of the text. And much of this has been possible because of this relentless effort and mentoring done by Colonel Gautam himself. And not to take away any credit, uh, it's because largely uh, because of this very purposeful, meaningful engagement with the text by scholars and researchers such as Dr. Bisht. Now, um, the downside of speaking last is that most of the points have already been spoken about, but uh, I think it bears restating, uh, you know, what I have to say here today. Um, so I'm going to start with um, broad comments about the book, things that have really uh, come out of the book as a reader, which appeal to the reader is what I'm going to start with and get on with uh, the micro points later. So uh, to begin with, and I think Medha had brought this up in her introduction, the title itself, Philosophy of Strategy, I think to me, very succinctly encapsulate the essence of the text. That is, this very seamless intertwining of abstract philosophical thought with prudent strategic insight. And I think the book has indeed, uh, you know, credibly established the fact that Cotillia is that exemplar strategist, um, to borrow Medha's own words, who reconciles Hindu values with strategy. So that's something which comes up in front and I think it deserves that prominence. Um, going out from that, I think this entire discussion about desirability and feasibility, which Medha also spoke about, uh, of, the <clears throat> of the central concepts of power, order, morality, which actually play out in Kotlin understanding of state and statecraft, in a way then to me alludes to this harmony of philosophy and strategy. And that is because the philosophy shapes the desirable and strategy the feasible. And this is uh, you know, strikingly reminiscent of 
John Herds, which I think Neda misses out in the book, uh, who talks about this fusion of, and this was I think in the early 1930s, the fusion of political idealism and political realism. And the reason I mentioned John Herds here today is uh, that Dr. Leibig would have liked to mention it. So, uh, you know, John Herds essentially spoke of how idealism and realism merged together, and he called it realist liberalism, where he thought that the basic ethical assumptions came from idealism and knowledge and insight from realism. But the book also stands out, I think, in situating the Arthashastra, and this is what Professor Pant brought out earlier, not as a body of thought that is trying to offer an alternative theory to the world. So there's really no exceptionalism here. Instead, it talks about different, uh, you know, contexts, cultural contexts, lending meaning to the vocabularies of power, order, and morality. And I think in the process of doing this, the author very convincingly draws parallels with Western theorization on this common set of vocabulary, which I think leaves the reader, and this is a, a very important point according to me, it really leaves the reader it helps the reader, in fact, appreciate both the particularity of Hindu political thought and also this is at one level and the universality of it in terms of the themes being discussed um, at another. And the author has very creatively achieved what she says somewhere in the book, I think it's on page 36, that studying concepts unique to certain traditions and then juxtaposing them with the generic understanding of concepts in international relations can be helpful in giving agency to certain non-Western ideas. I think this is what the book has very credibly achieved. Now come to these smaller uh, points uh, from macro to micro. I have about three points to make and I make them because it's both desirable and feasible because they concern my area of research directly. The first one is on the schools of Indian philosophy. The second talks about the treatment of the interstate domain in the text. And the third is about the concept of strategic culture. Okay. So I'll begin with the schools of Indian philosophy. And uh, by highlighting this here, I'm really trying to draw attention to an alternate understanding of the term, which is used so often, not just in the book, but in our discussion today. That's Anvikshiki, which the author, of course, describes as reasoned logical argument and according to her very rightly provides the critical perspective to the text and the light of new understanding of this term and uh, this has been confirmed by sanskritists anvikshiki is actually a combination word of anu and iksha anu is after iksha is consideration and together it means reconsideration so a lot of people actually think that anvikshiki is actually coterminous with the Nyai school of Indian philosophy, something which is seen as a roadmap of all the other darshanas, something which concerns itself with logic and epistemology. So an argument based both on observation and received belief is called anviksha or reconsideration, ultimately Nyai. Okay. Now, if you also look at the philosophical substructure that the book talks about, and of course, Scotland text also talks about of Samkhya, Yoga, and Lokaya. The Yoga here, again, since it's not hyphenated with Samkhya, actually stands on its own. And it is the Nyaya Vaisheshika school that Yoga is talking about here. So the yo it's not the Yoga Sutra or Patanjali's Yoga, but actually the Nyaya Vaisheshika school. And the reason why I thought it's worthwhile to point this out here is, that this new understanding of terms and philosophies actually fits like hand in glove with some of the assertions made by the author in the book. And I'll give a couple of examples here. Like Vaisheshika's primary dictum is that the universal inheres in its particular. And that I think alludes to the holism in Kautilya's grand strategy, which the author has so beautifully brought out. Um, second, Vaisheshika, according to Vaisheshika, dharma is defined as material progress and spiritual fulfillment. I think it's a theme which completely resonates with Kautilyan philosophy. Okay? So, so this is something which is a newer understanding of these terms, but I think they give a whole new dimension to the text and makes it much more richer uh, and something that we need to further investigate into. 
Coming to the interstate realm, and I know this has been um, a subject of much debate and discussion, but the author posits, and I always put the Purv Paksh first, that the neo-realist understanding of anarchy forms a determinist structure. And um, the author says that basically the states interact with each other within this determinist structure and define their political interests and shape their identities. And ultimately, she sees Arthashastra, where the deterministic trust is not so much because of anarchy, but on regulating and maintaining order. Now, although this normative fallout of this understanding of the interstate realm is very attractive to an Indian, I, I tend to differ. And I tend to differ for this very simple, basic logic. that if there is this political anthropology of Matsnyai, both in the internal and the external realms, and we know for a fact that Matsnyai cannot be curbed, curtailed unless uh, you use punishment or done, which we know for a fact is being used by the institution of state in the internal realm, uh, that does not exist in the internal realm at all. And if I can quote Binay Kumar Sarkar himself, he thinks that the theory of state is actually read on two diametrically opposed conceptions, that of the doctrine of dand in the internal sphere, which talks about curbing matsunyai, and the doctrine of mandala in the external sphere, which maintains an international matsunyai. Additionally, since we're talking about the interstate realm, I think the relations among states and Kautilya's interstate realm is essentially driven by a mix of things. So there's capability, there's relative strength, there's values, there are intentions, bhavin, right? And all of these, I think, together are not incongruent with this school of political realism. Okay, um, I make this point, but I also will uh, circumscribe it by saying that I do not doubt the extra political realist elements present in the text. And that's the whole beauty of the text, right? So, um, you know, it resonates with different theories at different levels. And I think you've brought that out quite beautifully in the book. And coming to my very own uh, uh, concept of strategic culture, it's something that I'm directly dealing with. I was, uh, you know, rather, uh, you know, uh, a little ambiguous about the author's uh, you know, commitment on this entire concept of strategic culture. So I'm just going to read out two statements made by her in two different pages of the book. So in the earlier pages, this is on page 29, she says that there is an overwhelming focus which has been given to the concept of strategic culture at the cost of concepts, which can offer rich insights on strategic thinking. Now what I infer is that she's almost lamenting the fact that there's this overwhelming focus and that if we were to just look at the concepts uh, on their own terms, we may have a richer insight on contemporary strategic thinking. Fair point. Towards the end of the book on page 170, when she revisits the concept, she says it is of course a question whether this strategic tradition survived in the post-colonial India, given the overbearing impact that colonization had on political ideas. The two statements are somehow, uh, you know, not fitting very comfortably with each other and therefore have a question for Medha. I ask her whether she thinks that a strategic cultural approach, which takes into account the conceptual philosophical undercurrent of the text, because otherwise then it would just be a very superficial exercise, and puts it to empirical test, right? Strategic culture is all about how it pans out in the field. And can this exercise potentially establish a text eternal relevance as a classic. And I'd like to conclude by making an observation which takes me back to this, uh, the, the title that we spoke about, that is philosophy of strategy. Um, at one level, Dr. Bish very convincingly establishes this, um, you know, philosophical articulation of grand strategy with yoga kshema as the political end goal, dharma as the means, and dhand as the ways, right? They're valid. Alternately, and I think equally convincingly, one can establish a strategic conception of grand strategy. So that would be yoga kshema or welfare and security of the people as the end goal. The prakritis, the seven state factors as the means to be deployed to achieve that end goal. And the shatkunya niti, essentially, as the ways to employ those means to attain the end. And the point I'm trying to highlight by making this observation towards the end is, but it helps us appreciate the text in terms of 
the breadth and spectrum of ideas that this magnum opus on brand strategy exhibits. And I think the author has made a phenomenal effort to send this message out to her audience. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kajri. That was uh, very useful. And I think uh, in some ways, uh, the, the, the larger point that you have made is uh, very valid. Uh, you know, the, the idea that you know, the text is alive. It's not a dead text that you know somewhere you are you are trying to draw out from from the you know archival text. It's it's alive. It's responding to the ch everyday challenges that a nation faces. So the interpretation also can have multiple variants. It can it can come from multiple contexts, and and therefore the prisms can differ. But at the end of the day, what you are trying to achieve from as a nation state, perhaps the goal remains the same. And I think I would I would let Medha answer your uh, your questions and some of the points that uh, Colonel Gautam also made. Uh, and I would also insert one question there, which is slightly related to um, to what Kajri was talking about, in the sense that you know this this issue of grand strategy and strategic thinking. Uh, I just uh, want you to sort of broaden this this argument a bit. Uh, and there is a great there has been a great lamentation in India that India lacks this tradition. You know, the Western scholars have looked at it, you know, India does not do grand strategy. There have been Indians who have talked about this, this, this tension in terms of our inability to, to do long-term strategic thinking. And there is some empirical evidence. You, you can always gather some evidence from here and there and make an argument about it. So when you read Arthashastra as a scholar, what are some of these empirical observations that you make about India's own ability to chart out a course, especially in modern times, uh, when you look at the threat perceptions, when you look at the institutional mechanisms, when you look at the political culture in, in the country? Uh, so, you know, the, the term strategic culture sometimes become too diffuse, too devoid of meaning. Uh, and so I, 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 you know, as a scholar who has written on this uh, and who has looked at it from a particular vantage point, what does uh, Cotillia tell us about this? And, and is there anything that we can gain uh, in terms of this debate, this particular debate of where India stands in terms of a strategic articulation and whether modern India somehow has let down Cotillia in some ways in not being responsive <laughs> to that challenge? So, over to you, Meda. Thank you. Yes. Uh... So thank you, thank you, uh, Colonel Gautam, uh, thank you, Professor Pant, and thank you, Kajri, indeed. I mean, um, I was really impressed uh, by your comments, uh, very sharp comments, and uh, they, in fact, uh, really took me back uh, to the time when I was indeed writing this book. Um, you know, as you rightly point out, I mean, I'll just pick up uh, that particular, uh, uh, you know, term strategic culture. And uh, yes, I mean, uh, it's been a very, very conscious choice uh, not to use this term. And uh, I have, uh, I would say, a couple of reasons. Uh, I had a couple of reasons for it. But since, uh, you know, most of the time when we are referring to Cotelia, you know, we are talking about strategic culture. So I thought that perhaps it would be nice for me to just insert a paragraph. And therefore, if you would notice, you know, I don't go uh, dwell on the concept of uh, strategic culture beyond two paragraphs. And there is a reason for it. And the reason I would say is that, you know, when... Uh, you are looking at the concept of, or when you're studying the concept of strategic culture, it's really about the continuities between the past and the present. And uh, in that context, if one was to really say that does India have a strategic culture, uh, you know, the question which comes to me, which comes first to me as a researcher, is that uh, which strategic culture are we really talking about? Um, you know, and as I again consciously, uh, you know, put out that. Uh, the strategic thought in Kautilya's Arthashastra is actually inspired from Hindu philosophical tradition. And I think, uh, uh, you know, that itself uh, is a statement uh, where you do not want to really essentialize a particular strategic culture in a country like India, which I would say is a civilizational entity. And, uh, and, uh, and so that is one, you know, now the second reason why I do not really use the word strategic culture, because, you know, as a student of diplomacy, as a student of international relations, when I look at India's neighborhood policy, uh, I mean, of course, when you, uh, uh, you know, go back to Nehru years, and you really look at the vision of Asia at that point of time, which Nehru had, I mean, you 
might just come to different conclusions. But then when you look at South Asia, uh, you really do see, and in fact, extended Asia also, you do see uh, not the strategic thought of Kautilya's Arthashastra so much so in there, uh, but um, I think you do see a lot of colonial uh, footprint. Uh, so, and uh, that colonial footprint or colonial legacy, I think overburdens our foreign policy. And uh, this is where um, I think my own critique of Indian foreign policy starts. Uh, when I really look at issues, and I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, you know, when uh, I also work on water negotiations, water diplomacy, and something which I really see, you know, the framings of uh, our foreign policy, you know, there is a meta narrative, and this meta narrative is uh, primarily uh, centered on security issues. And what really happens, I think, in due process, because, you know, South Asia as a region really thrives on its borderlands, what really happens that some of these developmental issues, some of these lived issues, issues of the people uh, really, uh, uh, you know, do not uh, 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 get visible. And uh, this, I would say, uh, you know, is, is this gap in Indian foreign policy, because this gap really talks about this caveat between the micro narratives on the ground and the meta narratives on the ground. And I think that, you know, if one was to really take inspiration from some of these strategic texts like Mahabharat or even Arthashastra, you know, we need to really take into account the intertwining of the micro micro and the macro, because it is that what really gave life to strategic thinking or strategic thought, uh, you know, in Kautilya. And that I see is missing. So that is the reason why I did not really, yes, I was very cautious of using the word strategic culture. Because if you look at the strategic culture right now, I see the footprint uh, of colonial legacy more than of a Kautilyan mind there. And uh, there are umpteen of examples there, you know, I mean, uh, one could really uh, go on in even in terms of, you know, I'll just give you a very fine example. And as I said, you know, Kautilya is really a minefield, a minefield of nuances. And I think all the Indian strategic texts or Indian texts are a minefield of nuances. For instance, if you look at Kautilya's Arthashastra, uh, you know, uh, and again, you know, this comes in from my own training, from my own training as a diplomacy student, it's not really much focused on negotiation analysis or verbal sort of communication. It's on non-verbal communication. It's on these dialogical strands, which are very fine, which are very nuanced. And I think when we are really talking about a strategic sort of a roadmap, or we're talking about strategic inspiration from these texts, we need to change our lenses, we need to change our concepts, and we need to really change the way we are looking at things. So, uh, you know, and, and that is the uh, lack of resonance, which I really see between, uh, uh, you know, Indian strategic thinking at present, and uh, whether there is the Indian strategic culture. And therefore, I say that, yes, I mean, I'm not very confident about the Indian strategic culture. Uh, Indian strategic culture is, yes, very much influenced by, uh, 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 you know, by uh, the, uh, the, the colonial legacy. Uh, but yes, when it really comes to strategic thought, definitely, we had a very, very rich strategic thought. Even even to the comparison of comparing it from, uh, you know, with some of the Chinese philosophical strands where there is a Confucianism, there is a Taoism, and there is a legalism. There are three separate texts on it. But then if you look at Arthashastra as a composite text, you will find actually strands of Confucianism, you will actually find strands of legalism, and you will actually find strands of Taoism. So I think there is richness in this text. But, uh, and as I've pointed out, pointed it out again, and that is the reason, you know, why uh, I picked up on those nuances before getting into my main argument, that uh, mimicking the text would actually, to my mind, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, direct us into a very different uh, lane of understanding. And here I would, in fact, uh, really agree with Professor Harshpant, you know, who said that uh, different prisms can be used to interpret the text. Um, and um, I think those prisms matter. Those prisms in contemporary India matter. Those prisms um, in an India where, uh, and in a world where majoritarian nationalism is picking up really matter. So I think that as researchers, we need to really, uh, you know, have that fine difference in terms of understanding the political and interpreting the philosophical. These are very distinct. They can have a very rich conversation. Uh, but uh, at the same time, um, I think if you transpose Kautilya's Arthashastra to a post post Westphalian world, uh, which is, I think, burdened with this idea of nation state, you know, the interpretations uh, can actually lead you to a very wrong direction. So uh, that is one of the main reasons. Also, I do not use the word strategic culture. I do not try, really, really try to establish a conversation 
between the past and the present because this is the pre-Westphalian understanding. But while it is the pre-Westphalian understanding, I in fact celebrate it because this pre-Westphalian understanding is telling us something very fundamental about the political. And the understanding of political is holistic here. The understanding of political is composite here. And I think, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, what uh, 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 this is what a very distinct uh, uh, South Asian legacy, uh, you know, sort of uh, inclines to and directs us to. So, um, you know, this is uh, what I have to say about, uh, uh, you know, strategic culture and why I do not really, you know, I'm, I'm not very ambiguous on it. I think that was a very, very conscious choice not to really dwell on, uh, dwell on strategic culture, uh, but on strategic thought I did. Um, on... Um, uh, on Professor Pan's uh, question, uh, what does Kotalia tell us about strategic articulation? Uh, you know, uh, as you say, uh, I, and I really agree with it, and I think what Kajri was also really talking about uh, the meaning of classics or the utility of classics. Uh, you know, then uh, why do we read a text like Arthashastra? What meaning or what value does it really have uh, when you look at the contemporary world? You know, I indeed see some value, though I have a cautious uh, sort of an optimism in terms of tr trying to transpose everything what Cotelia said into the contemporary context. But in terms of the strategic artic articulation, I think Cotelia's Arthashastra does a phenomenal job. For instance, uh, I mean, you know, some of the points which I raised, for instance, I mean, this braiding of the macro narrative and the meta narrative, you know, this braiding of the Kutaniti and the Rajaniti, this braiding of governance and diplomacy. Because if you look at the Saptanga theory, the Saptanga theory, the seventh element of the Saptanga theory is the ally, is the friend. And I think that is very significant because, uh, uh, you know, the external and the internal is intertwined. Also, uh, you know, if you look at the Shatagunya philosophy, again, in terms of strategic articulation, you know, the way I would interpret it and perhaps, you know, would put my heuristic caps on would be very different. You know, I would say that what the Shatagunya policy tells us is that, and again, maybe this understanding flows in from my training, uh, you know, in diplomacy, uh, is that it tells us that one needs to have flexibility uh, in terms of approaches towards foreign policy. One needs to be flexible because, flexible because the moment when rigidity sort of steps in diplomacy, there is where, uh, you know, conversation ends. And I think these six strategies which Kotelia is really talking about uh, is a talking about the flexibility is really talking about, uh, uh, you know, the malleability which you need to have uh, when you are uh, in the domain of foreign policy making. Another thing is that there is a direct connect. There is a direct connect between the state and the statecraft. And I think this is so very, this is so very important because, uh, you know, when uh, Kotelia is in fact really talking about the Shadgunyas or the six strategy or the six uh, uh, Gunas, you know, uh, he's saying, actually, go back to your state. You know, if your state is an inferior state, perhaps you need to, uh, you know, adopt different policies. If your state is a superior state, perhaps you need to adopt different policies. And I think the reference point here is really, is really the state. And I think that is, again, you know, um, a strategic articulation for me when we are really trying to look at India's foreign policy in the 21st century, where I think the domestic is equally important when it really comes to questions of external. The third, uh, I would say, uh, uh, and this is something, you know, like, as I said, you know, it's such a minefield. I mean, it's uh, every time you look at Kautelya's Arthashastra, you know, there are directions to which you want to go to. Uh, but uh, the concept of dharma, and uh, uh, Professor Pant, you were also talking about, we need to perhaps ponder on this concept of dharma. But perhaps, you know, my, uh, I need to yet read the book. I have the book, but I've just read sections of it. But, uh, uh, you know, my response to perhaps, uh, 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 you know, uh, Dr. Jai Shankar's book would be that one of the major takeaways as a student, which I really take on, uh, uh, take from Mahabharata, is the bradedness of the, uh, uh, the, the, the micro and the macro. And I think Indian foreign policy, uh, India's neighborhood policy needs to really take this into account, the bradedness of the micro and the ma macro, because there is a big gap there. And it's high time after, uh, you know, decades of independence, we do that. But having said that, uh, you know, if you look at the concept of dharma, and when you look at the concept of dharma, just as a student of diplomacy again, uh, what is the utility of dharma? I think dharma here is that fluid interlocutor. Uh, because dharma, in a way, it's that anchor. 
you know, it's that reflexive point. It's just that reflection point where uh, a particular king is really trying to, or, uh, you know, a particular individual or the state is really trying to think about the consequences of action. So the dharma becomes that, uh, I would say, reference point, that reflexive point, uh, which uh, where knowledge and action sort of of marry each other and um, you know when I again talk about strategic articulation and I go back to Indian foreign policy perhaps uh, uh, you know uh, what I would uh, dwell into is the meaning of frames uh, you know what is that specific frame or uh, you know where India can actually project its strength so we do say that we have civilizational links uh, you know we do see and, and I think you know when it really comes to India's uh, foreign policy it's uh, uh, it's um, it's diversity in fact can be a virtue when it really comes to its foreign policy goals so uh, for me uh, uh, you know dharma has been used as this larger frame it is that fluid interlocutor which gives meaning to power which gives meaning to morality which gives meaning uh, to justice and and all of that to me in contemporary India, what would be that fluid interlocutor? And I think for that, as again, going back to you, Professor Pan, uh, one has to really look at the constitution of India. One has to, in fact, really also go back to these very bright minds during the anti-colonial movement who were actually trying to reconcile the tradition of India and the modernity of India. And I would say, uh, I don't know whether I'll be investing myself in this uh, kind of work in future, but I would say that many of the answers in terms of getting uh, uh, back to the uh, uh, tradition or, uh, you know, like getting the indigenous uh, in, uh, going back to the indigenous, you know, lies in really sort of, uh, you know, sorting out some of these very, very complex issues, which I think we as a young country, a very diverse country have. So this is what I have to say. Uh, thank you very much. We have already run out of time, but I have, uh, you know, two, uh, two questions, if you can briefly respond, Medha. Uh, one is about, uh, you know, I cannot let you go without uh, having the perennial question of China-India uh, talk, having talked about, you know, we, we, uh, there is, of course, what, what is happening on China-India front is a different matter, but the relationship has always been very complex, very um, contentious in some ways. Uh, and you also have the, the very different intellectual traditions. Uh, some, some have tried to find, uh, you know, convergence there. But you often see when you look at the assessment of China being made or, or an assessment of Chinese foreign policy conduct, you look at, uh, you know, either Confucianism or Sun Tzu is, is bandied about. Uh, how can we prevent that from happening in the Indian context? where? Uh, you know, every time you say, let's study Indian foreign policy behavior, you just throw a line of cotillia. I mean, I, I, I mean I'm just, I mean, how can we build on a larger intellectual tradition here, which allows us and outsiders to interrogate us more seriously and uh, us taking ourselves more seriously without getting into this perennial, you know, problem of, uh, of looking at our ancient texts uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ad hoc basis. Where, what kind of a knowledge tradition are we developing? And I think that ultimately is also, you know, what uh, Colonel Gautam was trying to do perhaps in his project. But going forward, given that so many of you are now working on these areas. So in terms of knowledge building traditions, uh, where are we going from what you have already achieved? I think that's one question as a student of international relations I'm very interested in, you know, going forward, both in terms of what is happening to the field and what, we, uh, what increasingly we'll be teaching our students. Uh, the other is, you know, uh, you know, uh, a slightly different question about the relevance. Uh, you know, you talk about, we have already discussed a lot about how relevant Arthashastra, Kautilya remain, how alive the text is, and how uh, different interpretations can allow us to have different uh, understandings. But if you look at the contemporary sort of, uh, you know, um, Kajri talked about revival and sort of renaissance in the field, what does it owe, you know, what, does, what do we owe this to? This, you know, a simple question about what, why is this happening at this particular point in time? Is it simply a question of India's rise in the global stage uh, that, you know, India looks at it more seriously and therefore outsiders are trying to understand India more creatively and therefore going towards uh, indigenous traditions, Indic traditions, whatever you might want to call it. Or, you know, something that you touched upon, the, the, the way international environment is, is evolving. And again, you have had policymakers who have talked about that contemporary international environment is fluid, uncertain, uh, which perhaps previous environments were also that, that way, but 
today you find yourself in a situation where you then don't really know who are your allies, who are your uh, you know enemies, how you are going to in, in, you know what kind of relationships you are going to have. Uh, in fact, we use the term issue-based alliances, uh, where fluidity in, in you know is something that we take as a net net gain. And so, so is this something that the, that the nature of the environment is propelling us towards a certain direction, and therefore also making a text like Arthashastra more and more relevant to our contemporary inquiries. Uh, or finally, you know, again, a, a question that, again, an issue that you touched upon, is this also a question of India's own political evolution? I mean, we have to be honest about it. Uh, if India's center right today were not this powerful, we would also be having very, very different kind of debates. Certain texts would not be privileged. Certain kinds of push would not come. So there are people out there that have pushed a certain interpretation of Indian foreign policy, Indian culture, Indian IR, whatever you might want to call it, in a certain direction. And there is a more broader contestation of intellectual ideas at, at, you know, at a level where perhaps we have not seen. And that is something that is that the political contestation is allowing us to do. So you know, where do you locate this, this field of inquiry? And where do you locate this revival if you see this revival as something long lasting? Final two questions. So uh, I hope I remember uh, the questions uh, well. But then, you know, on locating the Arthashastra, uh, I mean, uh, again, you know, going back to my own journey, as uh, you know, Colonel Gautam said, uh, Arthashastra, you know, as a text had always fascinated me. Um, and I have been very politically neutral, I would say. And in that context, uh, you know, I always wanted to really go back to this ancient Indic trip. Uh, you know, text, even as a student of diplomacy, even as a source for diplomatic studies. I mean, there is where my own interest uh, came in. But then I know that you're really focusing on the macro level. And that is where, you know, things get complicated. But I think when we started this project in 2012, um, you know, it was really uh, not governed by, uh, you know, a, a, any environmental pressure or any structural, uh, structural framework, which was literally pushing us towards it. I mean, as far as, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, me being a part of the indigenous group, uh, uh, you know, felt, uh, we were really trying to really look at some of these concepts and really trying to dig into this pre-Westphalian tradition. And I think over a period of time, I mean, as you rightly, rightly point out, I mean, this question has been there in my mind for a long, long time. And, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and yes, definitely. I mean, there is a politics to it. And therefore, I think one is one has to be very, very cautious when is when one is really looking at Arthashastra uh, as a text. Uh, you know, which uh, lens are you looking at from? Uh, because uh, the philosophical legacy, you know, philosophical legacy of Arthashastra is totally different. There is where you're getting into this whole idea of critical skepticism. There is where the whole idea of anivikshiki becomes very important, which I think Kajri had also seriously put in. But the moment you actually uh, sort of get into political ideology, you know, you want to tie Arthashastra to a political ideology. I think there is where Hindu philosophy gets distorted. And uh, I have, uh, you know, no two views uh, about it uh, because uh, I think Hindutva as an ideology and Hinduism as a philosophy are two very different things. Uh, so when you are actually putting the lenses of Hindutva as an ideology, uh, you know, your interpretation really changes. And for that, uh, for, you know, to, to sort of take this uh, sort of an argument uh, further, and this is definitely not an analytical stretch. Uh, I mean, if you look at the concept of dharma, this is just an illustrative uh, uh, issue here. You know, uh, dharma is also known as duty. But the thing is that, you know, if you want to just contemporize it and you want to transpose it in 21st century, you know, under the umbrella of ideology, then dharma as duty could be very, very different. It, it, you know, it, it could be very dangerous, uh, you know, whose duty, I mean, 21st century, we cannot really transport, you know, that 3rd century BC text here. Um, and it is here that I would say, uh, you know, it is here that I would say that uh, one needs to mediate this by, in fact, really going back to our own thinkers during the anti-colonial movement, because I think that they were very much aware of some of these ideas, and they were, uh, uh, you know, uh, really looking at these issues. So, um, you know, definitely it's politically, uh, you know, uh, 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 I would say that one has to be very, very cautious when one is really using philosophical slash political ideas. It is really a thin sort of a domain, a thin line between the two. And uh, there is where I feel that nuances and the big picture is important. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, the question on China, if I missed it, uh, what was the question on China? Uh, I mean, 
the, the second oh, I was just 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 trying to argue that you know look you have the Chinese uh, you know when you interrogate Chinese foreign policy behavior today you often uh, there is a there is there is a sense that you go back to the to the texts to, to ancient wisdom Confucianism Sun Tzu yeah, are, are bandied yeah, about yeah, yeah. and so is this something where that we might end up having with, with yes, the Indian yes. I, mean, I think the broader question was how do you see yes. the knowledge evolution yes, happening yes, in that yes, sense? yes. Uh, so I got that you know I just remembered it so you know on the knowledge building process and thank you for actually putting in this question and perhaps uh, I don't know whether any of my students are into this talk uh, but uh, you know I teach this course on diplomacy and uh, uh, international negotiations and that I have a particular unit called non-western diplomatic practices where particularly I look at Chinese philosophical tradition I look at uh, Indian philosophical tradition I mean earlier at SAU I was also teaching a course on classics uh, strategic themes where I was primarily looking at classics per se but now uh, since I'm looking at it you know in terms of knowledge building and in terms of putting all this into perspective what I usually do is that I give four frames to my students the first frame is that of conceptual apparatus and this again uh, uh, you know uh, each frame really comes from a particular reading and the conceptual apparatus is very important so for instance when we're really talking about power you know what does uh, power signify I mean for instance when I'm really looking at I'm not just uh, expert on China but definitely when I'm looking at uh, a Chinese understanding of power the concept of Shea fascinates me which is really comprehensive power which is really dynamic power so uh, you know the conceptual apparatus becomes the first frame which I give to students the second uh, frame which I give to students is really ways of thinking and ways of thinking is again important to me as a student of international relations and you also raised that question because questions of meta theory are important than theory because meta theory actually concerns itself with epistemology and ontology and theory really takes that further so when you really look at the ways of thinking it becomes very important for us to understand you know how uh, do you know uh, what is the difference of thought in different geographies so how do the chinese think how do the asians think how do the indian think think you know i think that kind of a legacy needs to be revisited um and uh, so ways of thinking becomes important and there is where uh, you know uh, uh, epistemology or uh, knowledge uh, uh, structures become important uh, meta theory becomes important the third uh, frame which i give to students in terms of knowledge building is again international relations theory so where does it how does it really speak to some of the concepts in international relations theory so the understanding of power understanding of sovereignty understanding of peace becomes what is the understanding of peace for instance you know if you would sort of you know look at uh, maybe the Islamic understanding of diplomacy or even even the Kotlin understanding of diplomacy what is the understanding of peace you know does peace mean that uh, uh, you know is uh, does it mean that law and uh, diplomacy are really a function of peace and that is where it ends. I mean, that's what the European understanding says, that peace is the ultimate uh, uh, sort of end goal because it's the reason, the system that we're talking about. So, uh, you know, um, and, and the fourth one, which I would say the fourth frame which I give them is about diplomatic practices. That how are, like the, the question which I think Kajri was sort of raising about strategic culture. So when we are looking at a particular country, uh, you know, does the diplomatic uh, practice tell us something very distinct about the ways of thinking, about the way these concepts are in fact understood in specific geocultural spaces. So this is the way, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, this is the process of knowledge building, I'm sure. And I hope that at some point of time, maybe after 10 or 20 years, uh, you know, we can have another, uh, maybe uh, an Asian understanding of diplomacy or Asian understanding of diplomatic practices, because this is what I guess is really missing in Asia. Thank you, Medha. This was excellent. And thank you, Colonel Gautam, for initiating this project so that we, we are getting such such wonderful works. Thank you, Medha, for writing this. And then we look forward to your book, Kajri, so that uh, we have covered the entire span, the entire intellectual um, space here on, uh, in the discipline. I'm definitely not having Medha on my book launch because she doesn't believe in strategic culture. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Thank you so much for, for joining us this, this afternoon, this evening. And thank you all who joined us uh, for this uh, excellent discussion. Uh, more power to this group. More power to uh, to uh, you know to those who are interrogating Indian foreign policy, international relations through uh, the prism of India's own intellectual traditions. And we look forward to many more such works going forward. Thank you, Meera. Thank you, Colonel Gautam, and thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Thank you, Professor Thank you.